coordinator here at the museum and I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight to see our presentation and to see this exquisite show. <laughs> I would like to thank our sponsors uh, Judy Fair Spaulding, Dick and Debbie Benson, Alan and Leslie Layfield, Bill and Ann Faith Family, and the Heritage Inn. And also a reminder that uh, it's 10% discount on an item purchased this evening for Mataranko Museum members. And uh, we will now turn it over to Rebecca Smith, and we'll get started here. I'm going to put this in your pocket. Opening. It's uh, very exciting for me to have my work on display here at the Atlanta Museum. Um, uh, this is a process that began uh, well over a year ago, when, when I, well, actually a couple of years ago, when I participated in the Sierra Art Guild show uh, and met uh, Carol Wilcher, who uh, then introduced me to the people here at the museum and got the ball rolling on me, um, applying for and being accepted for an exhibit here. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I first became familiar with this area with the, uh, the Coso petroglyphs um, about a dozen years ago when I came up for a visit to, the, to Death Valley and stopped in Ridgecrest and discovered the museum. And then later that same year came back for um, one of the tours that you arrange here through the museum and uh, discovered the petroglyphs, uh, fell in love with them, uh, particularly the ones that have the shape of the, of the human being, the anthropomorphic figures as they're called by the archaeologists. And I immediately was struck with their uh, spiritual uh, nature uh, and then started to read about them and, and learn about at least the theories. I don't know if this is the predominant theory, but the one that inspired me was that these were uh, images that were carved uh, and, and related to the practice of shamanism. Um, and I'm going to uh, just refer to some notes while I go through this because I do tend to forget what I wanted to say. I don't want to leave out too much. Um, but I found, uh, when I went back home and started reading up on it, I found several sources, including the National Park Services uh, site that, that describes the uh, shamanistic beliefs uh, and described it as a form of worship based on a direct personal interaction between the shaman or medicine man and uh, the spirits in the spirit world, and that th they believe that the petroglyphs uh, resulted from that kind of practice. And I think I'm probably uh, preaching to the choir here, telling you what I think or what I've learned through my reading about what the petroglyphs represent. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what it was that inspired me to uh, make the weavings I've made based on them. So uh, going with that the theme of the uh, shamanistic uh, connection with the petroglyphs, um, what I've learned is that the shamans would travel to special sites and, uh, where they believed they could, uh, sites that they believed were inhabited by supernatural beings or supernatural spirits. And according to historical accounts, the Koso Range was a primary regional site where shamans would come to from all over the southwest as far away as, as Utah to um, obtain supernatural powers through their uh, rituals. Uh, and the supernatural power that they were most concerned or most uh, intent on, on finding here was power over rain or to create rain. Um, and water sources were thought to be uh, portals to the spirit world. And this area 
although now is you know quite a dry riverbed, you can imagine that what at one time had water in it. Of course, this is not a picture from the period of time that the uh, petroglyphs were made. I just thought this was a good representative scene of what the, what the uh, riverbeds around here might have looked at looked like during the time that the petroglyphs were were being made. So what I've read is that the shaman would. Uh, use the help of, uh, of native plants like the native tobacco shown here to kind of enter a trance state. And in that trance state, they would um, uh, have visions and they would receive power from spirit helpers that they would encounter while they were in the trance state. And uh, some sources say that the shaman would actually merge with their spirit helper that they encountered in their trance state and take on characteristics of that spirit, and that's why a lot of the uh, anthropomorphic figures have uh, the bird characteristics, the bird feet like this one. This one's been interpreted as having um, the quail top knot feather, which is a headdress specific to the rain shamans. And um, the spiral design in the face is uh, concentrated supernatural power. And then one thing that's never really been explained really well in the, in the literature I've read is that they just call them pattern-bodied anthropomorphs. And the patterns in the bodies are unique to each one and have never really been connected to any particular uh, kind of power. They're just individual power, patterns of power for each shaman. <clears throat> so since this was such a major real, uh, regional center for uh, shamans to come to conduct these vision quests, uh, there's quite a gallery of these anthropomorphic figures uh, found here in the Coso Range. <coughs> And I know that you all recognize a lot of these, and they're, they're um, in the artwork among the um, people here shown at the Sierra Art Guild show this, this uh, weekend, um, the public artwork that's around town. Um, and I've chosen several of these um, to create tapestries of this one here. You'll see these represented in the gallery here tonight, this one here and, and this one. And so that's a... Uh, it's sort of the, the gallery of characters that I've been inspired by for the weaving that's on display here. So I began weaving, and this goes back um, about 10 or 12 years now, I began weaving a series I called The Shaman's Vision, uh, because with this background of these figures having been created during uh, shamanistic rituals, um, I thought, well, this is perhaps what the shaman saw. I, I figured in their trance state, they must have seen some real eye-popping colors and uh, obviously, you know, very massive feather headdresses. And so what I tried to do when I began to put these into my artwork was to recreate some of the aspects that could not be preserved through the stone etchings that we still see today. So here's the original, uh, a picture of the original figure of this one. This is the drawing that's been made by people who were ever able to see it uh, more, more closely than uh, that image. And then here's my uh, original rendition of, of that particular uh, petroglyph. And then uh, the one that I showed earlier with the quail top knot. And um, some of these images I've, I've woven uh, many times, but each one is different because I will uh, always uh, begin anew when I start one with different, a different color idea or just uh, create this as I go as far as the interior coloration and, and the backgrounds have changed over time. This was a, a background that I wove with hand dyed yarns to kind of get the feeling of, of the rock uh, forms and the ones that are in the room tonight have more of a mountain background so um, over the years I've changed my ideas and designs a little but I've always kept to the petroglyph um, the original image of the petroglyph uh, idea. And then um, after a while, I began um, taking the images out of the frame and making some freestanding sculptural pieces. And so this one is based on uh, the image here to the, to the left, and that's my rendition of it. Um, putting on the massive feather headdresses always makes me feel like these, these come to life. Um, it's, a, it's a simple woven form, really. That, that part of it is the part that I weave, and then I like to embellish it with the, uh, the stones, the feathers, uh, bringing in a lot of other natural elements to make them come to life. And in the ones, a few of the ones that I have here tonight, this uh, little stick 
coming out here is actually an Indian prayer stick, um, which I, I happened to find at a, or at a Southwest show once and decided, well, that would be a really wonderful addition to, to these figures. <coughs> Um, this one, it took me a while to get around to weaving this figure. Uh, to me, it's so uh, otherworldly, almost like an alien with that, you know, strange head. But um, I love the, the patterning in the body, and it really wove up very wonderfully into a tapestry. Um, and so I, I finally did make a tapestry of that image. And then um, uh, this one, which I, I know is very popular around here, I think it might even be on the website of the museum. Um, this particular uh, petroglyph image, and that's my uh, sculptural image that I made from that one. Um, I also have looked outside of this area for, for imagery. Once I became enthralled with petroglyph imagery, I wanted to see, and I got books that showed the imagery from other sites throughout the Southwest, and I found this map, which I thought was very interesting, because it shows the concentrations of rock art sites throughout the Southwest, and of course, uh, we're somewhere around would you say right around in there, or a little further north? I'm not really sure how far north we are here. Um, so that there, you can see there's quite a lot of uh, rock art sites in the Central California area. And then up here in the um, Four Corners area, of course, large concentrations. And so a lot of the imagery that I've, that I've looked at and, and also uh, woven tapestries based on has come from some of the other, other sites. This one is uh, a site in uh, Arizona. And I liked this, it's so different from the images, uh, imagery here where all the, all the uh, figures seem to have arms and are holding tools or whatnot. And uh, these are all figures without, without limbs. They're, they're mostly you know, just the torsos and the heads. And, um, oops. and um, this is a close-up of some of those images. So from those I began to weave the, some of the images you see here that are just the torsos and the heads and don't have the, uh, the arms. And, and to me, they're, they're a little more abstract. They're still a very human type figure, um, but they just have the abstraction of only having a torso. And, um, and, and then I, with these, I've just very much improvised what the bodies would look like rather than following a specific pattern. Um, this is an image I saw in a book, and it's from um, Southeast Utah. And it's, it's very unusual to see two of these figures touching in kind of a, um, a, they have some sort of kinship between them. And so I wove the figure and uh, titled this one, Twin Spirits. And then of course, um, Coco Pelli, everybody's familiar with Coco Pelli. I don't think there's any Coco Pelli imagery in the Coso range, but uh, it, it appears throughout the Southwest. And uh, from what I've read, it's got a, 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 a lot of different interpretations, but it is a, a Hopi figure, and uh, it's believed to represent a fertility figure. And I chose uh, this figure to kind of walk you through the process of creating a tapestry. Um, so, just step back. So once I've identified uh, an image that I, I like, I'll come up with uh, a line drawing. And you'll notice about this that there's no interior um, detail for what I'm going to put in the body of the image. It's just really a, a line drawing of the uh, figure itself so that I know where to put that within the body of my tapestry. So I start with the drawing, and I start with a spool of yarn. And what I do is uh, I mount the drawing. The, the, the spool of yarn becomes my warp, and that's these uh, vertical lines that you can see going here. That's the warp that's been strung on this loom. This is one of my looms. It's a very modern-looking loom. It's all made of uh, metal and copper. Um, and you'll notice also that the the uh, the picture has been turned on its side, and that's actually the way that uh, all these tapestries are woven. Um, there's a choice when you're a tapestry weaver of whether whether to weave your tapestry uh, straight up as it's going to be mounted, or from the side. What you do is you look at. Uh, where most of the long lines are. Mm -hmm. And in all these figures, all the long lines are going to be vertical lines like this, but they're easier to weave as horizontal lines. And uh, so that's why I weave them from the side. So I take the image that I've drawn, which is called a cartoon in tapestry weaving. And it's called a cartoon not because it's funny or anything, but because um, 
it's a term that comes from the Italian word for, car for cartone, which means a drawing, basically. Uh, so tapestry weavers still use the old term for a cartoon. And the cartoon is then uh, stitched, <coughs> uh, basted loosely uh, to the tapestry, to the, to the uh, warp after I've woven a hem that will get turned under later. And then it's a matter for me of weaving um, so that I can match up my weaving to the outline of the figure. And there's a close-up. And every place that you see where these uh, threads of warp, thread, the warp threads are crossing the drawing, that's where I've got to work my magic as a weaver to create the lines that will uh, become that woven image. Um, and so I thought if I did these and just quickly flip through them, it would look like, kind of like a flip book. And you'll see this as the tapestry progresses. It's all woven up from the bottom. I start with the background, and then I eventually get to the figure and start weaving that in. And more figure, and then find, here I'm right to where the body is going to start, and so then I can start deciding what I'm going to do in the body of the figure as far as color. But that's all put in without a drawing ahead of time. So that's where I just really get creative and uh, somewhat freeform and, and just decide what I'm going to uh, put in there. And finish the drawing, uh, weave up the rest of the way, and voila, it's done. Yeah. 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 Turn it over <laughs> and uh, embellish it to my heart's content with uh, feathers and a nice turquoise stone for the face and frame it. And that's how the finished piece comes to life. Uh, now, a um, little change of, of topic here, um, I'm find where I am in my notes. Um, so there's other aspects of petroglyph imagery that I also find fascinating, and uh, geometric designs obviously uh, interest me because they um, are reminiscent and even sometimes identical to geometric shapes that are still used in uh, Southwest textile design. And so the connection between these petroglyph images and uh, textile is one that I was very that I'm very interested in as a textile uh, artist. So I was um, very um, surprised in my reading to find out that there's actually quite a lot of archaeological evidence of text of prehistoric textile activity in the southwest uh, southwestern U.S. dating back to the same period of time that all this uh, petroglyph uh, or rock art activity was taking place. Um, in fact, the southwest U.S. is one of four regions in the whole world that has such a large uh, abundance of ancient uh, textile remnants in the archaeological sites. And um, they believe that's because it, it's such a dry climate, for one thing. And a lot of times the, the uh, textile uh, remnants are found inside caves, which have been used for burials and also for ritual purposes. And so a lot of the evidence comes from, from cave sites. But anyway, this map shows uh, where a lot of textile uh, remnants have been found within the southwest, and this is Arizona. And so you see this is all eastern Arizona that's outlined here in pink up into uh, southeast Utah. And the chart over here shows the, per the time period where um, a lot of textile remnants uh, date from, uh, going back to about 200 AD, which is the earliest uh, evidence, um, and coming on up. And these are the two major cultures that have been studied, the Mogollon and the Anasazi. And I've also put here, in the darker color, the major period where the textile evidence um, is uh, loom woven. And there's a, there's a marvelous book that I've uh, used in my research um, by Kate Peck Kent on prehistoric textiles of the Southwest. And she's looked at uh, textile um, remnants from all those areas and uh, also explained how the uh, the, the earlier periods uh, down in, in, in this time period was uh, hand, hand manipulated waves and when they get and when it got up to about 700 AD um, through trade with central Mexico the loom was introduced to the American Southwest and actually she says uh, this area uh, you know this far north was actually rather culturally backward compared to what was going on down in central Mexico. And I guess when you think back to the Mayan civilization and the Incan civilization, that makes sense. But it was through trade, and you can imagine how far away that trade had to extend for the 
the loom technology, loom weaving technology, be brought all the way up from central Mexico up into the southwest U.S. Um, so that, that was eye-opening to me that tra trade routes were so uh, widespread way back that in such a historic period of time. And so I use this as a, as a source for my research. And um, I just thought that uh, my interest was in seeing whether any of the geometric petroglyphs that were pictured in all the uh, books I had been looking at matched up with any of the textile remnants that were uncovered in the area of the southwest U.S. And since they overlapped in time period, I wondered if they might overlap in geography as well. And it seemed, seemed obvious to me that they would, but then I would see statements or uh, descriptions like this in, in the books on petroglyphs um, for these uh, common geometric shapes that said that they, though they consistently resist interpretations, they are perhaps part of a sophisticated symbol system. Um, so I took a look at them and also the images in the book I just showed you by, by Kate uh, Peckkin. And this is one of the remnants that she has studied in that book. And um, this one is from southeast Utah, and it's described as a diamond twill tapestry blanket that dates to about 1100 to 1200 AD. Um, and I've called this, uh, for, for my purposes of this presentation, the uh, enclosed stepped diagonal design, because it, they're always enclosed and it's a step to diagonal here. This, this over here is just a blow up of this little part of this whole uh, fabric that was discovered in southeast Utah. Um, and uh, Kent writes a, a, a phrase about this piece that I found I really resonated to as a weaver. She says, fabric analysis always reveals something of the weaver. And I think that's very true. Um, at least. At the very least, one learns respect for the quality of mind that could envision a pattern as complex as this and carry it out in three colors, because this was originally three colors, one weft row at a time, and the weft is the, the weaving that goes uh, uh, perpendicular to the war, to make a blanket 55 and a half inches long and probably about the same width without penciled sketch or written directions as a guide. Um, so it's really quite an amazing feat. She says, to be sure one does find the main lines of a textile design scratched on a rock or plastered wall at a few sites, but this can hardly be called a detailed working plan. So she does draw the connection between some of the um, geometric uh, designs that are, that are found on the, in the rock art and the weaving from the same time period. So take a, take a look at this stepped, enclosed step diagonal design. And then here are four petroglyph images that I found in various books, which all have the same stepped, enclosed stepped diagonal designs. Okay. And then this is a map showing this is this is the general area where the, uh, the uh, textile remnant was found, and this is the general area where these four <coughs> rock art uh, images were found. Um, and and going back to um, the uh, revelation, for me at least, of how far trade routes extended from central Mexico up to the southwest, it doesn't take much of a leap of imagination to see that these areas would have been in communication with each other, and that those were indeed um, two different media, um, artistic media, uh, representing the same, uh, same types of designs. Uh, this is another example from Ken's book. Um, this one is a, is a bag. Here's the full image over here, and then this is a little uh, blow up of one of these um, smaller <coughs> patterns within it. It's a bag woven in what she calls a weft float, float pattern weave. This is from Montezuma's castle in Arizona, and it dates from about 1100 to 1400 AD. And this uh, detailed motif, motif I've called the repetitive design of square spirals. <coughs> And that was so that I could keep that in mind as I looked for petroglyph images that might relate to it. And so I found a repetitive design of square spirals in many of the books that I was looking at. And I again um, looked at the map to see where these, how these might have coincided, coincided geographically. This here is the uh, textile remnant, and these are the, this is the rough location where the rock art images were found. So again, through trade routes or just um, 
you know, travel, communication between tribes. Um, I, I, I think that there was probably some relationship between what was being woven for um, the uh, functional items such as this woven bag and then the art that was being uh, drawn on into the rocks as, as rock art. Okay, a couple of other quick examples here. Um, on the right, this is from uh, Kent's book, and this is a slit and interlocking tapestry uh, cradle band. And this is uh, a band that was used as part of a cradle for carrying a baby. And uh, it, it also amazes me that such beautiful, beautiful uh, intricate work was being woven uh, that, that long ago and for just everyday functional things as is for a cradle to carry a baby. Um, and then this is a sample of, of rock art also found in Northeast Arizona, which this is also from Northeast Arizona, um, showing a very similar shape and similar design. Uh, now this one I find interesting. This is a little more stretch, uh, of a stretch of my imagination. Um, this obviously is one of the petroglyph figures found here in the Coastal Range. This is um, a white cotton string shirt um, from Northeast Arizona. So geographically, these, uh, these two items were not you know, found in similar locations, but uh, if we can imagine that there was trade going on between Arizona and California, which I don't see why there might not have been, um, it just, the similarity of this design and this design uh, struck me. And so it kind of, kind of made me feel a little stronger in thinking, well, maybe those pattern-bodied anthropomorphs that have defied um, analysis are really just clothed beings, and what they're showing is some type of textile uh, garment that the, that the uh, shamans were wearing, or that they saw in their um, in their trance states that related back to the type of garments that they would have been wearing in real life. Um, so my point here is that far from being lifted from the realm of the ordinary, as that one quote said. These geometric pe uh, petroglyphs may actually be depictions of just ordinary objects in use at the time the petroglyphs were made. Um, but I'll leave that theory to be proven by someone with much more scientific interest than I've got. Um, these days, I'm pretty much happy just to look at the pictures in the books and not, not worry too much about um, the scientific theory behind them. Um, but as you can tell, I have been my interest has been sparked by the similarities between the rock art and the textile designs. Um, and I wanted to then show you just a few more um, ge geographic or geometric images that I've started to weave into the beaded pendants. And this is my, my latest endeavor. I've got a few samples here in the show, and um, I just wanted to um, share a few of these with you. This is a petroglyph image. Um, and this is the design that I created based on that image. Um, this was just a, a drawing mm -hmm. found in a, in a book. I, I haven't seen um, a, an actual photograph of that petroglyph, but then I created um, a pendant to go with that. Um, and this is the image from the cover of Kent's book, and this is actually an apron front. And it's a, it's a double. Uh, this image then is repeated on the other side that I've hidden, covered up here with the image of the beaded pendant that I've woven based on, based on that um, image. And then um, I'm starting to do uh, some of the pendants uh, to actually reflect the petroglyph, uh, the, the anthropomorphic figures that are found in, in the closer range. So that kind of brings me up to date to um, where I am now and where I plan to go with this um, um, interest of mine in, in weaving, creating weavings based on ancient imagery. So I thank you for your attention. I'll answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Okay. Just an observation. You might also look at hard. Where you got some yeah. of the images there that you're showing uh, from the rock art and from the te textiles mm -hmm. are identical to pottery images mm -hmm. from the same era. Uh, and so there's, 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 I think you're, all, you, I think you're right about the overlap of the images. And I think these images have been used in, in, in pottery, textiles, rock art, all sorts of things. Yeah, I th and I think the interesting question is which came first? Where did the the specific geometric designs originate? Was it in in the weaving process or 
or in the, in the pottery. I tend to think it might have originated with the weaving because the design and technique uh, in weaving are very closely related because you're working with the grid, you have your warp and you have your weft. And so the geometric designs flow very naturally from that. And so I think it was more likely that um, those designs were woven and then transferred to these other types of expression. But that's just my theory. I'm no expert, I'm just an artist. <laughs> yes. Uh, you mentioned that you felt that the uh, rock art petroglyphs had a lot of color somehow with them. And why, why did you envision that? Because I've never seen any of our rock art that suggested there was color. No, not the rock art itself, because I think that the people did not, probably did not have the means to create colored images. The, the image they were seeing in their trance state, I imagine, was full of color. That's all, you know, I just thought, you know, if they were seeing these, these beings with these fantastic headdresses of feathers and somehow, you know, clothed in some kind of pattern, whatever, fabric, whatever, that there was probably color as part of that and that I as an artist could, you know, use my, you know, artistic imagination to kind of recreate or, you know, embellish. I think some of the pictographs have color in them. What did? Some of the pictographs. Pictographs, yeah. right, because they're drawn they're on other some, materials. Some color in some but of the uh, petroglyphs are just really yeah. scratched yeah. into the oh, stone. There, there, is, there is a theory now that's being promoted by some in the archaeological field that these images may have been originally painted. But the painting will be long gone because these yeah, things are exposed. Yeah. yeah. The only place the uh, pictographs survive is in protected areas. Right, yeah. Like the Barrier Canyon things, they were protected by an overhead. Right, yeah. And, uh, so they may very well have been had uh, mm -hmm. pigment on the bridge and we can't tell that. Yeah. Just like Greek statues probably didn't have it. Well, and yeah, when you think about it, I mean, all the ancient monuments, um, I shouldn't say all because that's a dangerous word, but so many of them were full of color. Um, I was in Egypt last year, seeing things 3,000, 4,000 years old, and in some places the color was still preserved. Mm -hmm. um, most of most of them were just the bare stone now, but you know the cathedrals in in Europe had a lot of color in them, but they don't now because the the color has been lost. So it's possible that these have more color in them, but I'm not going to put that theory forward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not into trouble. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, one more question. No, no.